Hello, my name is Tim and um, I'm working for Prisma as a TypeScript engineer and I will talk about how Prisma solves the N plus one problem. So as I said, uh, I'm uh, working for Prisma as a, a TypeScript engineer and I'm living in Berlin. You can reach out to me um, at uh, Tim Suchanek on, on GitHub or Twitter if you have any questions later. So what we'll cover today, we will talk about this mysterious N plus one problem uh, what it is about and we also will um, uh, see how we can solve it and how Prisma is helping us with that. So the n plus one problem is basically as old as data is, as old as for example SQL. Um, here we see a, a GraphQL query. Uh, for the people not familiar with GraphQL, we will dive a little bit into it and explain how this query is being resolved. Um, so we will dissect this a little bit and as you can see we are querying for a user here. We say something like a user take 10. And what this is uh, doing, this is giving us the first 10 users. It's giving us the ID, email, and name, but also all the posts uh, that the user did in our blog. You know, we um, just have an example blog application. And for every post, again, we get the scalar fields, ID, title, content published, but we're also getting all the comments, the first 10 comments that have been posted to that post. And uh, as you can imagine, there is quite some data fetching involved here. And um, so how would we actually resolve this? Um, in order to understand this, uh, we have this uh, graph here, this um, illustration. And what this is basically about is that in GraphQL, you always start at the top level. In our case, it's the users. We start with the users. <clears throat> so we resolve the first 10 users. And we get, for example, George, Alice, and Bob. And now for every user where we got the scalar fields already, we now need to resolve the posts. And again, we go through all the users, get all the posts. That's the next level of the query. And again, in our graph, so to say, we need to traverse this graph. Yeah, um, How is this a graph? Uh, any relation, uh, relational database you can see as a graph. Uh, you can just say that the, the rows in the, in the database are basically the nodes and uh, um, the relations between these nodes are the edges. Yeah? As we see here, a post is related to comments. And again, after we got all the posts, we now get all the comments for the posts. So we have to do requests uh, that uh, return the um, according data. And um, so let's, let's look into how uh, we can implement this. Um, we're using uh, the GraphQL.js implementation to resolve this in, in Node.js and uh, we wrap it with the Apollo server. And what is uh, happening here is that we say, okay, we have a resolver and a resolver is basically the thing that is responsible for uh, giving us the data. And this thing is fairly simple. Uh, we have a SQL query here and we say, uh, please select um, all the columns and uh, give us back uh, only the first 10 users. And again, as soon as we have the users, we continue and we say, give us the, um, the first uh, 10 or whatever we query for posts for the user. And again, we go one level deeper. We have a select specified here for each post. And for each post, this, will sec so this select will be run. Uh, the GraphQL.js engine is passing us in the post object that we already resolved in the uh, level before. And now we can just take the post ID and say, give me all comments that are uh, uh, pointing to the post with that post ID. Um, so let's run this now and uh, try out how, uh, how this stuff is working. So um, I prepared a simple server. Whoops, let me quickly open that. Um, yeah, there we go. Apollo uh, with uh, Postgres. So let's log into this. Um, we're using the GraphQL Playground, uh, which is a um, console that helps you to query the GraphQL uh, data. And so we will send the same GraphQL query that we have been seeing before in our slides. So let's query this. Okay, as you see, we get back the data as expected. We get uh, JSON data back. Uh, we have the polls, again, the polls uh, have comments and so on. So this is what we expected. And now let's actually look into the queries that have been generated under the hoods uh, to make this happen. And as we see, whoa, 
we have a lot of queries and the problem we have like many select queries here and the problem is really we're generating so many select queries per post and what is actually happening here this is really a lot uh, the truth is we are um we are probably sending 101 queries and this is exactly the n plus one problem and what this is about is that we say for one user we have to do n queries to resolve the data for the posts. And that's exactly the n plus one, or you could also just call it one plus n. And let's let's look into that in our um, into our illustration that we had earlier. <clears throat> so here we see, okay, the first query. This is now just uh, uh, the numbers of the queries. The first query, is the users query. We don't get around that. We need to get the users first. Then for each user, we do another query to get the post. So we have a uh, query two, three, four. And then again, for each post, uh, we need to do another query to uh, query the comments. And this is exactly what the n plus one, or I also like to call it the one plus n problem. It's exactly what this is about. Uh, we need to do a lot of queries. And uh, the problem here is that we're putting a lot of strain on the database. And uh, this is actually exploding exponentially by the hierarchy, by the number of levels uh, we have in our queries. So um, if we would, for example, have 10 levels in the query, now we have three, uh, we have user, post, comments, but we could also have 10 levels, then it would be um, n to the power of 10 queries that we need to do. And if n is 10, obviously this doesn't work, like this doesn't scale at all and uh, we would just shoot down our database. And the truth is this um, naive implementation that I have just been showing you here is very slow. And uh, it's only, I, I benchmarked it locally. It's a MacBook uh, Pro 15 inch 2018. I benchmarked it and the truth is, 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 is can, it can only handle two and a half uh, requests per second, which is nothing. So that would mean if we have in our live system uh, three, concurrent requests from the users, we are already at capacity. That's obviously not what we want. Uh, so this is very slow and let's optimize this now. And in order to uh, optimize this, um, I will show you first of all, just without doing any magic, without doing any work, um, how the same uh, resolvers with the same um, uh, uh, GraphQL server will look like if we use Prisma. So again, we have exactly the same GraphQL server around this, the same type system, et cetera, but we now, instead of using SQL, we uh, implement the resolvers using Prisma. And um, again, we first get the, um, all the users uh, that we need. Then we get uh, the posts for the users. For each user, we repress that user and we get the posts. Yeah? Uh, and uh, again, the same deal here, we get the comments for each uh, post. And um, this is already much more readable, as you can see. This is type safe. That means if I, for example, have a typo and I call it uh, were instead of where, um, the compiler directly helps us and tells us, uh, did you mean to write where? Well, obviously, this is one of the main uh, benefits of uh, Prisma. And uh, obviously, this uh, type safety you don't get in SQL. Nothing is happening if I just remove a random character here. And again, we didn't do anything special here. We just replaced the SQL code with uh, Prisma client code. And as you see, it's much more readable and also much more flexible. We can easily uh, put another chain behind that, and it gives us uh, um, the data that we need. And with the chain, I mean, we can say, give me the user. And then dot posts, we can have this chaining API to give uh, back uh, the posts for that particular user. So, um, okay. So how can we now fix this problem? We now uh, are aware that this is very, uh, very slow and we would like to um, get uh, rid of this and we would like to optimize this now. How, how can we uh, make that happen? And um, in order to try to optimize it, we first need to understand what is even, even happening uh, under the hood. And what is happening is this is just pseudocode. This is not the real code, but this is just here to illustrate to you uh, what's going on. 
So again, we're first getting all the users. Then we're looping through all the users and fetch the posts for all the users. And we do a promise.all, a wait promise.all. That's a very important ingredient, the promise.all. We will later uh, come back to it. And again, we now here get all the posts. And once we have all the posts, we say, okay, uh, for all the posts, loop through, through the posts uh, with a map, give me all the comments, and again, await promise all, which is nothing else than waiting for all the promises to be resolved. Uh, and if one promise rejects it, the whole thing rejects, the whole thing errors. This is basically what is happening under the hood. And this is basically also, uh, uh, if, you, if we now trans, uh, uh, tr translate that to our graph that we have, this is also how this is now uh, working uh, in, in, on our graph here. We say, okay, all the user queries, we do, and we basically have a promise all, about all around them. And again, with all the post queries, we have a promise all. And you probably already can guess it. The idea now is to batch all of these uh, very related queries. They basically all look the same. They just uh, query for a different ID for a different user. We can batch these queries together and optimize them. That's the idea. Now, it would be beautiful if we could hook in exactly in the moment in time when the promise.all is being awaited again here, this point in time here. If we could hook in then and just say, okay, thank you for all the queries. I will now take them and I will um, squash them together. I will optimize them somehow and um, send an optimized query to the database instead of sending n queries. We would like to send one query. And um, what if I told you that process next tick is exactly that? This moment in time when the, uh, we are awaiting the promise all, when we are waiting for all the user requests, that's exactly when the process next tick kicks in. And you can basically imagine this um, as if we are basically cutting, like let's say we have this long stripe of uh, incoming requests, yeah, uh, request after request on the timeline, left to right. Um, then we, you can basically imagine the next tick to basically cut out the piece, the, 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 uh, the request that we need. Um, and here you already see the actual query that we will do instead. We, we will use a user ID in query. So instead of uh, requesting three different users and getting the posts, which would result in three different uh, SQL queries, we are uh, just doing one query and we say, give me all the posts where the user ID is in this list. And that way we can squash all of these uh, queries together. Again, the post has a column called user ID that points uh, to the user table. <clears throat> and again, the same we can do with all the comments that we want to have from, for the posts. Yeah? We can again wait uh, and hook into the next uh, process next tick. Uh, in exactly that moment, the GraphQL.js implementation is waiting uh, for all the pro for all the uh, uh, resolvers to uh, return to resolve um, and we can just say okay exactly in that moment we will kick in we take all of these queries we batch them together and then optimize them into this one query called comments find many and then we get uh, all the comments that are related to uh, uh, any post in that list of posts <clears throat> And this is basically it. And um, earlier I showed you um, that we could just easily replace the SQL queries with uh, Prisma. <laughs> but now how can we turn on this magic process next tick optimization thing? And by the way, this magic process next tick optimization thing is also called the data loader pattern. And the data loader pattern is, uh, has been popularized by, by, by Facebook who also initially came up with, um, with GraphQL. So let's check this out, how this would look like. Um, <clears throat> again, we have this implementation here. Uh, we didn't do anything. We didn't write any like process next take and whatever. We don't even know. Uh, we don't even have to know the content of the data loader. Uh, and let's now start this server and let's see what kind of queries are being generated with this server. So again, we have been running our uh, naive implementation. Now we will go for the 
um, uh, implementation using the find one in, in, in the resolvers. So let's look into that. Yeah, so again, we have the same graph your playground here. We execute the query. Okay, let's look into the logs. Okay, and as you see, we don't have like a hundred queries, but just a few. And let's look into them. The first query that you see select blah 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 ID, public user email, name from public user. Uh, uh, this is basically just giving us back the user. So, by, by, by the way, these are all the queries logged by Prisma that Prisma are now do, uh, is doing under the hood. Then we get the IDs, we need them to do our uh, resolution. Then we already get all the posts. Yeah. Again, we use the ID in trick. This is exactly, and this is not only what we uh, could write in the um, Prisma client uh, syntax, this is actually directly translating into the SQL syntax with the in operation. <clears throat> so this is something that the database can directly understand. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, back and forth with 500 queries and whatever. This is directly coming back uh, this is directly something that the SQL uh, database, uh, in our case Postgres, uh, can resolve. And as you see, we just turned like the 100 queries into like, what is it, five queries. And um, this already makes things much faster. So the left implementation is able to handle on my machine two and a half requests per second. The implementation on the right hand side already can resolve about 12 queries per second, which doesn't sound like a lot, but um, again, uh, remember, uh, we are requesting 10, 10, 10, that means 1,000 items, um, and the response JSON is actually 240 kilobytes. So it's already something. It's still not like 12, <clears throat> still not a lot, but again, we already got from 2.5 to 12, which is a huge improvement. And um, what have I told you? that we can even go faster. Um, so the thing with this implementation here is that uh, this is already quite awesome, and this is also the recommended way, by the way, but um, there is a lot of back and forth between Node.js and Rust. So that means first in Node.js, we do the batching. It's like a hybrid approach. Yeah? We do the batching in Node.js, but we do the optimization in Rust. And why do I suddenly talk about Rust here? In case you are not aware of it, uh, the core query engine uh, for, for Prisma is written in Rust to make the database interaction very fast. And um, we have a thin layer of TypeScript on top of that Rust code. And um, again, this back and forth obviously takes time. And what if I told you we can get rid of that back and forth? And we can. For the people who want to really squeeze out the last bit of performance, uh, we have something, or well, not we, but actually uh, Ahmed uh, Eliva, someone from our community, implemented a beautiful plugin. This is from the community. It's not something we officially support. But if you're really uh, interested in squeezing out the last bit of performance, then you can have a look into this. And um, so how does this look like? Um, again, we have the everything is the same. Yeah? Like we use Apollo Server. Uh, we use Prisma. Um, but what we do now, we directly take the query as it is and uh, pass it in and we transform it into something that Prisma client understands and we pass it in into Prisma client. Uh, we basically delegate Prisma client to handle all of this resolution. So instead of basically relying on the GraphQL JS engine, resolving all of this data, we are asking Prisma Client to do this. And um, for the people who have used Prisma Client before may know that we you can say something like, um, give me all, uh, give me users. And you, you now can say select, um, I want, for example, the ID, but I also want to have the posts. Yeah, That is, for example, something I could do here. And now let's look into that. So we say, um, for example, result is this we can see here now that the response type uh, of this query is actually typed. And this is exactly what this uh, plugin from Ahmed is doing under the hood. It's taking the GraphQL query 
and it converts it into this select syntax, so how we call it, uh, of the Prisma client. So that Prisma client, and therefore also the query engine, can directly take care of the resolution. And again, this one, we can also just run it for fun. This one um, also uh, obviously is the same deal as we with the others. We can execute this bomb. And let's look into what is happening. And we even have less queries. This one is even more optimized than uh, Prisma in particular. So what we see is what we want to see. We see that only three queries are being done. Yeah? Again, we have three levels. We say user post comments. And we are only doing three queries. Again, coming from this, that does a select, 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 back to this, which is only three queries, is obviously a big improvement. And um, so how fast is this particular one? Uh, this one is able, if you also use a faster uh, GraphQL server, it's able to deal with 50 uh, requests per second. And suddenly, this is something that we can talk about. Yeah. Um, so let's look a little bit more into numbers here. I did some benchmarks. And um, one interesting thing here is that <laughs> people oftentimes think, oh, no, I need to have a fast server. Express is not fast enough or something like that. Yes, you can use a faster server, for example, the Fastify implementation uh, of, of a GraphQL uh, is, is a bit faster. But as you see here, with the same setup, it just gives us 10%. It's nice, but doesn't give us that much. The change, however, uh, from going with this very uh, inefficient implementation where we do n plus one queries all the time per level of hierarchy versus doing the data loader optimized approach gives us a lot. And if we now see going from the 2.6 to 50, yeah, we get 50 requests per second there. We get a 20x improvement in speed. Um, and this is, there's no caching yet activated, nothing. This is the same uh, uh, stuff. We just use Prisma and uh, Fastify, which is very easy uh, to use. And now, as you <clears throat> cannot unseen, uh, uh, in the first row, we have this enormous number, 2,725 queries uh, uh, per, per second. But um, here, I just wanted to mention that oftentimes people completely forget that you can do caching um, in GraphQL. Caching GraphQL is tricky because you would need a cache probably per resolver and so on. There are tools out there, however. and um, Depending on your use case, caching can really make a lot of sense. Let's say you uh, need to implement something like an Instagram timeline, where you say, OK, it's totally fine if the data is stale for five minutes. Then you can cache this data, uh, even in a CDN, and Kevin can have it uh, blazing fast. And in this case, I just wanted to show you, this is basically the pure like network overhead, the pure, OK, how fast can we shoot our data out in this particular setup? Uh, we can shoot uh, 656 megabytes per second out uh, if uh, the query is cached, if the result is cached. In other words, it will not even hit uh, the database. So this is interesting um, also to look into. It's a huge topic. You can work with e-tags and whatnot. But um, just FYI, it's not just uh, solving the N plus one problem. It is the biggest bang for the buck when you have the uh, non-cached version. But caching can also be interesting. Um, all the benchmarks are made, uh, many more benchmarks you can check out uh, on my GitHub, timsuchanek slash n plus one. Um, and that's basically it. Thanks for your attention. Tim, thank you so much. That was really insightful. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, I mean, with GraphQL becoming the thing these days, uh, it seems like uh, we've got a lot in the in in store, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot is happening there. It's quite uh, exciting to see. I, I have the feeling every second day there's a new library on the top uh, front page of Hacker News about uh, GraphQL, <laughs> and also while GraphQL is already quite old in the JavaScript ec ecosystem, I have the feeling people are already looking for different approaches sometimes. Um, there's still a lot to solve, and it's still a non-trivial uh, problem to fetch nested data. Yeah, so maybe you're ready to take some questions? Yep. 
So, I mean, the first question that's coming up is, uh, what is GraphQL JIT? Is JIT just in time? Does that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the GraphQL JIT uh, is actually a project uh, that comes from Zalando, uh, oh, okay. uh, who are in Berlin. And I remember last year we sat down uh, here in Berlin in, uh, uh, in, in Mitte, we had uh, lunch with uh, some of the Zalando um, developers. So for Zalando, the main thing is performance. And um, so what they wanted is to increase the performance of their GraphQL implementation. And uh, we talked about an approach that we saw in the Python world uh, where the leading um, framework called Graphene, they were working on an approach for that. I think it was not called Graphene, that new thing, but uh, the idea was basically that you are uh, completely compiling down a function that is uh, already specialized, so to say, on a specific query. So what you need to uh, be aware of is if you have a GraphQL JS server, you are basically um, always, let's say 20,000, scalars come back or in, in a, a response, you're calling uh, 20,000 functions. And um, that takes effort. And there are issues in GraphQL.js. And Why are there 20,000 function calls, if I may ask? Um, so that is the case because uh, the whole idea of GraphQL is that you are uh, tying together multiple uh, data sources, which you cannot trust. In the case of Prisma client, it's different uh, because we know Prisma client is type safe, et cetera. But uh, in the case of Facebook, for example, who came up with GraphQL, um, they, for example, said by default, everything is optional. And you have to explicitly say that something is required. So they have the, the opposite uh, paradigm in that regard. And uh, so for them, it's rather, okay, I cannot trust the data source. I don't know, maybe it doesn't even return anything. So they actually check for all the uh, data to, to come back. Um, that's why they check, okay, is it null, uh, this required string? Does, does the data actually uh, come back? Uh, and that's why they need these 20,000 um, function calls if you have 20,000 scalars. And now the idea was, um, so we told the uh, Zalando people, hey, maybe you want to look into what they're doing in the Python ecosystem. And actually they did that. They looked into it and uh, came up with this library called GraphQL JIT. And the idea is the following. They take your GraphQL schema, they take your query, and they turn the query into um, a little bit something like a prepared, sta prepared statement in, in, in database speak. That means the whole query is already passed. And uh, the resolver function is already completely generated. So the, what they are doing is uh, they're using the new function uh, keyword in, in JavaScript. You know, in JavaScript, you can do uh, fancy stuff. You can, for example, um, uh, in runtime, create a new function that can then be uh, instantiated. We're not talking about the evil eval statement. We're talking about new function. You can, uh, in runtime, instantiate new code. So you essentially pass a string, which is like the function, the code for the function exactly. definition. And what GraphQL JIT is basically doing, it's looking into your um, uh, data, it's looking into your resolver, and it's uh, in runtime generating this function. And now the how is it solving these 20,000 function calls? It's basically, you can also check out the GraphQL JIT website. They have like an online compiler to see what's happening. But what they're basically doing, they're generating one huge ternary statement. And a ternary statement is faster than a lot of function calls, and that's how they made it fast. Yeah. Thank you. That was really, really cool to hear. So, I mean, speaking of performance, um, what are some of the performance improvement suggestions that you would have for uh, a deployment to something like AWS Lambda? I mean, we had a lot of in the polls, we saw many of uh, the attendees are deploying to um, to AWS and, and Lambda and, and function as a service providers. And I mean, all the serverless platforms. And then obviously the question comes up, I mean, whether you're with GraphQL or just vanilla Prisma, what are some of the optimizations that you would do there? Yeah, so what I talked mostly about in my talk was about in within your application, what can you do there? But uh, once you deploy this into production, networking is or is, is the, the main, where you get most um, main bang for the buck. And uh, one um, common mistake I saw um, quite often when, when uh, writing with people in Slack, et cetera, uh, if the database is in this different region than where your function runs, that already makes a huge uh, difference. What you need to be aware of with uh, Prisma, we are not doing joins. That means if you are giving us a huge nested query, 
Prismas never doing any join, but we are, as I said in the talk, doing the data loader pattern. That means uh, we get the first hierarchy uh, back, then we do the join in memory in Rust, do the second uh, uh, level and, uh, and so on. Um, so that means uh, the uh, distance between your Rust and your, um, or, or between Prisma client and your database is really essential here. And the lower the distance, the quicker the queries here. And another thing I have to mention here is that this approach, the, the big advantage of this is um, we are not putting too much strain on the, data, the database because we are doing the um, joins in, in uh, Rust. And this is a pattern that you see uh, bigger companies doing, for example, Facebook is using MySQL, but yeah, they are using MySQL mostly as a key value store. That means um, they put all the heavy uh, um, logic into application level because application layer, uh, the application layer, you can scale horizontally much easier, um, and that's an interesting pattern here that uh, we are using. And so the distance between uh, the database and the uh, Lambda function is very important. The other one is what everyone is talking about, cold start. The cold start of a Lambda function is a thing. Um, to start everything and to uh, build the initial database connection takes time. Therefore, we recommend to uh, initiate, uh, instantiate your Prisma client outside of the function. Um, therefore, it uh, is still um, in, uh, uh, the, the connection is basically still running even though the uh, Lambda function is frozen. Um, even though the Lambda function doesn't run, the, the uh, TCP connection is still there database and um, and Prisma think they are still connected um, unless there's a keep alive package which which invalidates it but basically you can reuse connections and in, in if you if you do that if you put your Prisma client outside of the function and that way you will also um, gain a lot of performance do you happen to know do you happen to know how long uh, a container of a function is kept around um, after a single call so if I make a call to a serverless um, yeah. function with Prisma, how long is that connection kept alive for before that's, AWS drops it? That's a tricky question uh, because nobody really knows it. Um, I can post a really interesting um, comparison link, a benchmark uh, in the in the channel uh, later and look it up uh, because there is a continuous um, serverless comparison uh, website. Uh, because there's not only Lambda, obviously, there are many approaches. And um, it de highly depends on their intelligent scheduling um, algorithm, basically. So uh, it can be a day. I think a day is roughly the time uh, if there was no further request to that lam uh, Lambda function. Uh, but it uh, highly depends on their uh, schedule. Gotcha. Well, Tim, it's been really wonderful having you speak here. Super insightful talk. And uh, you'll be around in the Slack channel. Is that right? Yes, I will be around. So if you have any more questions, you can ask. All right. All the best, Tim. Okay, see ya.